I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we have a guest. We do? Seriously? Yeah, he's kind he, of He's not the a, person sitting right across from me, is he? Um, no, actually, it's a it's a ghost in the other room. Uh, <sighs> we're doing... No, we're not going to do Pusong Ling today. No, we're not going to do Pusong Ling. <laughs> we need to do more Pusong Ling. We do. No, our guest today Boo. is... Well, he could be the ghost. I mean, we could go with that. <laughs> no, I was saying that that was a terrible line. It the was a terrible The guest today line. is Brandon False. Hello, Brandon False. Actually, that was supposed to be your line. You're supposed to say hello. I'm supposed to say Brandon False. Can Who's we, can on we redo that? I still can't believe first? you guys are still having me here. Yeah. I can't either, but you know. Well, you've been sort of a regular guest, and with COVID, we, we have wanted more guests, but it's been a little bit harder, and we're still trying to work out our um, online thing. Yeah. So anyway, we're uh, inviting Brandon on to join us for this podcast on Li Qingzhao, which is a part of our Song Dynasty poetry series. And today we're looking at, I think, probably the greatest female poet writer in all of pre-imperial China. Agreed. Li Qingzhao, who is a Song Dynasty poet. Famously, she kind of straddles the uh, the end of the Northern Song and the beginning of the Southern Song. 1084 she, to 1150. Yeah, sort of so, well, sort of. so in, in 1127, you know, things are, things are not super great in the Song Dynasty, and they're ruling up in the city of Kaifeng, which is now, you know, a backwater of a couple of a million people. But... But back in the day, this was a world center. This was jumping. Yeah, her her husband is involved in the Song Dynasty, and then it all comes crashing down when some bar- barbarians from the north come overrun the uh, Song capital, and the remnants of the Song are forced to flee to the south to the city of Hangzhou. Now, Li Qingzhao is, of course, a part of this, but she is known, among other things, as an absolutely stunning lyrical poet. From this dynasty. So, um, actually, we're going to talk about a few things by her. Uh, The first is a really moving uh, piece of writing. It's not even a poem. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting piece. It's an epilogue of a book that her husband wrote, and I think she had published after he died in the, the, the Barbarian Conquest. She talks about... Her husband's obsession, addiction, I think it's fair to say, um, with books. Actually, it's really both of their addictions, isn't it? Well, she benefits from it, but... um, She's addicted too, right? Where do you stand on this, Brandon? Settle the argument. Does she addicted or not? I think she's addicted. Ah, she's. It. I mean, they're they're talking about so in in this book in this epilogue to the book, they she is talking about how they're just like hanging out at night, drinking and looking at paintings and poems and and new editions. But it's not the kind of drinking that you may be thinking about. They're, no, they're drinking tea, right? Yes, sorry. And they're Good playing qualifier. tea drinking games. Yes. Not nearly as frat party level partying here, but uh, but, the, but they're they're like having to who is the first to be able to identify this book or this painting this or something line like, from one of line. one of the thousands of scrolls we have secreted away here. It's 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 drinking it's a drinking game, a tea drinking game that is kind of like a beer drinking game. It's a nerd fest. It's a nerd fest. But actually I think you guys are missing something. The winner actually has to, uh, well, gets to drink first, right? Which I think is important because I, it sounds like she was winning a lot, right? And yeah. I guess that's kind of like sticking it to the man she's getting to drink before her right. husband. She, and she, and she, she includes it as sort of a throwaway detail, but it's still kind of funny. And yeah, she begins the paragraph, by the way, I have a, an excellent memory. Yeah, yeah, just as a toss-off thing. So the implication, I think, is also perhaps better memory than her husband. This is not the kind of thing you'd brag about in, uh, in pre, you know, pre-modern day China. But we should also throw in that this is this is one of the things that I noted about this passage. That's why I want to I want to bring this up. She she mentions that when she wins, it makes her laugh so much that she spills her tea and she can't finish it. Now, that sounds like such a okay, whatever. But there are not a lot of pre-modern day texts that give you this kind of very, very, very Mu- seemingly mundane detail. It's very granular, isn't it's it? It's very granular. It's very just, oh, I spilled my tea. Ha ha. That's not the sort of thing you are used to reading in this kind of text. And that's one of the things that makes this so wonderful is her eye for just everyday detail. And, and, and it's not a very long passage. There's no real need to throw this in there, except that 
it's a much better story if you throw it in there. Because there is this association of women with home, this is a patriarchal society, you know, men are associated with outside and women are associated with inside. This is a clear kind of uh, explicit association, you know, uh, men are understood to be why women are understood to be nay. And, and there's a lot of symbolism that goes along with that. But because of that, women tend to write about these in-home details in a uh, particularly beautiful way, in a way that just men kind of ignore and, and they don't get. I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, and so speaking of some of those finer moments, some of those moments that are uh, described in fine detail, there's this one section right before the tea game, um, where she's describing uh, their nightly sort of routine of of reading through, um, you know, works of of literature, and she says, um, when he got a hold of a piece of calligraphy, a painting, a goblet, or a tripod, we would go over it at our leisure, pointing out faults and flaws, setting for our nightly limit the time it took one candle to burn down. Thus our collection came to surpass all others in fineness of paper and the perfection of the characters. That's such a neat detail. I like the line, I would have been glad to grow old yes. in such a world. world. That, yeah, this, this is, yeah, it's just so beautifully written. And, it's, and, yeah, and it's, this is, that little detail in particular is so important because she's not talking about uh, what they learned. She's not talking about how they advanced the field or or a lot of of the other sort of documents of this sort. She's talking about just the experience of it, the game itself. Just to point something out, there is a more than a hint of nostalgia here. I mean, she's, Very much she's so. thinking about a, not only possessions that she lost, a husband that she lost, but a whole world that's passed them by. I mean, the entirety of northern China was lost to the uh, the the horde, uh, and and there is this kind of sense of longing for for that old world. I would have been glad to grow old in such a world, she says. That is such an amazing sentence simply because you know, without even having read the rest of it, you know it's about to change. I would have been gr glad to grow old in such a world. Well, clearly you didn't. So what happens next, right? That, that eye for just narrative drama is such a beautiful detail here. And I think that's important because on the surface, it seems to be a story about scrolls and books and fine art, right? Nerd competition. But actually looking back on it, it's about the moments, those little moments in life that sometimes you forget to enjoy. And she's looking back nostalgically. And on I think this is important. It's important that you point that out too, because the way this wraps up, of course, is eventually her husband dies. Tragically, he's supposed to assume office in Hangzhou. And on the way there, he contracts a malarial fever and eventually dies. Between that moment and the tea game, they've amassed a huge fortune in books and other things, but because of the oncoming hordes, they've had to move again and again and again and again. The collection has been whittled down, whittled down into just a quote-unquote handful of scrolls. Um, by the end, she is commenting fairly negatively on this obsession. It's kind of hard to to think anything good about the husband after right. reading this because he's like... Here's my collection. Please take care of it as I am going off. You know, if you have trouble, get rid of these books first and get rid of these things first. But these things, the family lineages. Don't get rid of those. Die. Right. Yeah. Before says, you get rid of them. She like, says. Protect you know, them with your life. Describing his last breath. Um, you know, he asks her, for, I think, for a pen or something to write a poem. When he finished it, he passed away with no thought at all for the future provision of his family. I mean, that's a serious blow to a man in, in Confucian society, I think. Right, and especially coming on the heels of this very nostalgic, how wonderful it all was moment. Clearly, it doesn't end that way. And where she eventually lands with this is with the following statement. Uh, when there is possession, there must be loss of possession. When there is a gathering together, there must be a scattering. This is the constant principle in things. Someone loses a bow, another person finds a bow. What's so special in that? And that's, that's, that's a really powerful statement because essentially what she's referring to is look you know what it doesn't matter the size of the collection what mattered is the moments we spent together reading that collection that's what we lost over the course of these years right we just ended up focusing on the collection and not the experience 
And I think for her, there's definitely growth. I mean, she's warning. This is a warning. It serves as a warning to the scholars, right, who may also, you know, be overinterested in in these worldly possessions. But even in her husband's death, she kind of suggests that here he is. The reason the books are disappearing and being, you know, destroyed by the gene is because, you you know, he, he still has this urge to read the books and he's kind of taking them to the heavens with him, right? It's almost like, I mean, at several points, she suggests that it's the ghosts that are kind of consuming yeah. the books in their their reading of them, and that's why the books are being lost, yeah. Yeah. I found the quote here. It says, or perhaps the dead, too, have consciousness, and they still treasure such things and give them their devoted attention, unwilling to leave them in the world of the living, how hard they are to obtain and how easy to lose. Yeah, the, the sense of nostalgia that I was talking about before, it almost seems like this world that she was talking about before was a dream. Yeah. And there's definitely some some uh, elements of Taoism here mm-hmm. in this story. And I, I don't know if it's Taoism or really or Buddhism, but, but this uh, insistence that things are impermanent. And that that you can't have you can't grasp hold of these connections. And really, that's a great transition into her poetry in general, because that is if you're going to find a thread that goes all the way through all of her poems, it's this sense of how fleeting everything is. Mm-hmm. Her poems don't attempt don't don't try to, to grab hold of things and define them, pin them to a period of time that it appears to just sort of glance at them and let them go. Right. Let me just read one real quick here. A lot of a lot of the hers are untitled, or if they have a title, it's a little like Emily Dickinson's poems. They can be given a title because of the first line, but a lot of them simply are untitled. I think that's just the collection you're reading. Yeah, it could just be. I, I'm I'm reading a collection translated by David Hinton. But for example, this one, and this is one of my favorites that she she ever wrote, it goes this way: thin mist and thick cloud, a sorrow lingering on all day, incense buffeted from a golden animal. It was the 9-9 celebration again today. Inside gauze bed curtains, jade pillows, and a chill starting to drift in after midnight. Skies yellow at sunset. I sipped wine at my eastern fence, and a dark fragrance filled my sleeves. Don't say it wouldn't buffet a spirit away. Opening blinds to the west wind, I was the frailest of yellow blossoms. Now that last stanza just floors me. There are so many things that don't seem to add up. Dark fragrance filled my sleeves. I mean, what what does fragrance have to do with sleeves, right? Don't say it wouldn't buffet a spirit away. And then at the very last line, I was the frailest of yellow blossoms. And the first line is, sky's yellow at sunset. There's yellow and yellow. So what is she? Is she a person looking out the window or standing on her, at her fence drinking wine? Is she transforming? Is she being blown away? Is she dying? What's happening here? All of those are viable, really. I mean, she, she's not giving you a lot of places, like a firm ground to stand on, but that's kind of the point, right? Well, it sounds like she's given up the teacup for the Baijiu cup at this yeah, point, because so. all, of these, all of these poems that Rob sent us, uh, she's, she's pretty much drunk. And that, that was on purpose, actually, because drunkenness is something you associate with the great male poets, like Li Bai in particular. It is not a quality you typically asso- associate with the female and so it's interesting to read that and see her drawing out of it something similar to Levi, but a little different too. Levi, you know, that famous poem about looking out and seeing the moon, you know, which we've, I think Lee and I, you've posted, you've, we've posted a podcast on that, many, right? Many, many moons ago. Yeah, many, oh man. We should redo it. <sighs> or just repost it like we just did. So Levi looks out, sees the moonlight and just, you know, pines for someone, right? This is, this poem sounds like it because it was written much later she herself is immaterial. It'd be like if Levi looked out and and did did a Zhuangzi's butterfly thing and went, actually, am I even here? What am I really? Even the even the person looking out the window is not firm or material. And I, I think that that Zhuangzi's butterfly parable is really relevant to all of Li Qingzhao's works. I mean, I was thinking about it in the epilogue she wrote for her husband's book. That that whole kind of point of all of her writing is just that. Nothing stays the same. Nothing stays the same. You can't grasp anything. And does that matter? Right? That's where one of the ways she lands in that epilogue is what what was the point of all this stuff? Right? What the experiences you can't record anywhere. They're here and gone, but in many ways that's the only thing that's real anyway. And I, you know, we could read a lot of her poems. They they are very similar in that way. Like you said, very Taoist in a lot of ways. But but I mean elements of Buddha, Buddhism as well, right? Mm. The the whole sense of impermanence. Yeah, 
Stuff and, doesn't matter. And in all honesty, at this point in the Southern Song, Buddhism and Taoism are kind of already mixed together pretty thoroughly. Hmm. So my favorite poem that Li Ching Zhao has written, uh, there's a translation of it in Stephen Owen's Anthology of, of Chinese Literature, the massive book that everybody teaching Chinese literature teaches yeah. out of. And it's called uh, Ru Meng Ling. Uh, and like it, that translates just as like a dream. The poem mimics a series of earlier poems that are also named the same thing, like a dream. It has this this kind of misty, you know, we talked about the misty poets before, Rob. Hmm. There's this kind of misty sense of impermanence in this poem, too. I'm just going to read out uh, Stephen Owen's English translation. I will always recall that day at dusk, the pavilion by the creek. And I was so drunk, I couldn't tell the way home. My mood left me. It was late when I turned back in my boat, and I strayed deep among the lotuses. How to get through, how to get through. And I startled to flight a whole shoal of egrets and gulls. So she's there, she's been drinking, she's on the river. It sounds like a good July 4th, right? Right. Uh, um, and she's she's so drunk that she can't get back home, she can't paddle back home, and she scares some birds. And again, the flying thing reminds me of the butterfly. I don't know mm. if I'm making too much of that. Too much literary scholar. Yeah, but, but there is something going on here, and... How how much do you think she's drinking? Like she she is quite often drunk in her poetry. Her her persona, her poetic mm. persona, is drunk. I, who knows? I mean, uh, you know, we were talking about the tea game earlier. I don't think she's talking about tea here. You can't really get that far gone on tea, even if you drink a lot of it. Rob, I think you have once or twice. Could be. So how much has she been drinking? In in a, in, a, in a lot of ways, it doesn't really matter because it's that's 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 a convention, right? That's 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 a convention. Hang, in a lot hang, of wait a second. Wait a second. It's a convention for men to be drinking, but mm. not women. So in some ways, she is kind of turning things upside right. down. Right. Well, that's, well, that's what I was going to say is one way or the other, whether she's actually drinking or not, she's taking the convention and using it for her own purposes, right. which Just is by interesting. her adopting the convention, it's right. unconventional. Right. And I think that brings us to an important point that you missed, which is the- We the, missed something? We didn't miss something, dude. Do we miss something, Lee? I'm sorry to tell you, but yeah, Dang you it. something. Yeah, so um, one of the I think more important things about uh, the epilogue and her husband's work um, is that the there's a lack of clarity in the pronouns, and so doesn't aren't there like no pronouns? Or or there's something? no pronouns. Yeah, yeah. and so Hang on, wait a second. I thought pronouns were just a 21st century concern. Not when she was writing, <laughs> and so it's unclear if it's her husband enjoying the books or if she's enjoying the books. Mm. Um, and so there's this kind of blending of of the two people together. I think it's I mean I think it's her own way of like, you know, she takes a jab at the scholar saying, you know, don't be overly materialistic, but I think she's also taking a jab at like how can you write this, you know, this book about this man's life without actually talking about his wife's life, right? And she's right. a part of that and she partook in the joys of 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 reading and writing and and all of the, you know, the youthful pleasures of, of their life. Brandon, just to make clear to the listener what you're getting at, uh, classical Chinese, Wen Yan Wen, does not have gendered pronouns, right? The way she's writing, it's not clear who she's talking about. And that's one of the interesting things. And so she's utilizing this lack of gender to sort of further her own claims and the claims of, of, of herself as a woman. Yeah, definitely. I'd agree with that. Totally to insert herself into the narrative, into the story about her husband's life. And part of it, the, the, what's interesting about that is um, by muddying the waters that way, she it's like she gets to have her cake and eat it too a little bit, right? So would she be a poet and a writer without access to these massive collections? Probably not. On the other hand, having these massive collections ended up being quite the burden over time. So in some ways, you can even see this as a reflection on the burden of being a writer in general, right? Like, in order to get to where I am, here's what I had to do. But you know what? I'm not sure it was worth it. Can you, can you read it as a metaphor for the burden of being a woman in a, in a patriarchal society? Like having to carry around all this extra baggage, having men telling you you need to carry around all this extra baggage? Or maybe, maybe it could be. I mean, I'm always up for some kind of uh, against the grain reading like that. But it also could simply be maybe, maybe a regret a little bit at 
how you are expected to live if you're a literatus, a writer or a scholar or somebody, right? In, in, a, in, in a society, a properly patriarchal society like this one at that time, here's what you had to do to look smart and act smart. When in reality, that's not really the way it is. Uh, and, if, and you can be who you are in a very different way and still qualify as intelligent and intellectual. You don't have to have mastered all these dusty tomes and write poems the way they tell you to. You can do it a little differently. And I, and I think I think that's an interesting observation. It could This could be also her looking back and going, you would have been great for me to have been able to write some of the poems I've written and not have to have, you know, mastered all the necessary stuff to play that tea game. We just drink tea. And I think it's interesting because it's not just in her literature. It's not just the jab at her husband and his and the epilogue to his to his great work. She breaks the mold not just in her her writing, but also in the way she lived her life. And so, just to give a little background to her biography, after her husband died, she wound up getting remarried, and that marriage only lasted a hundred days. Mm. Uh, she was drinking heavily and writing more. I mean, and you know, she took a jab at her husband in the epilogue. I mean, so it's it's it's. Not the happiest of endings. So, is Li Qingzhao the greatest female Chinese poet in, pre- in, in imperial times, or is she a country singer? <laughs> like the Dolly was- Parton of <laughs> imperial China. I love it. That, that's what we should call this episode. Or the, the Loretta Dolly Lynn, Parton. maybe. Loretta Lynn had yeah, a harder Loretta life. Lynn's much better. Is. You know, I don't think Li Qingzhao was ever in a coal mine, though. No. Uh, but she has lots of heartbreak stories about husbands, so that could also well, for different reasons, not for books. I don't think Loretta Lynn would have worked well if her husband was just addicted to books. I, I think I think that's a good place to end it. I, don't, I think she was proud to be a scholar's daughter, <laughs> scholar's daughter. <laughs> not, oh, not a man. coal miner's. <laughs> and that that's the right place. That's to the end right this. place to end it. All right, I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore, and I'm Brandon Falls, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.